going inside the issues of our community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. Homelessness has been a major issue in urban America for 25 years. In the past decade, crime has once again become a central focal point of public discourse. And in the political rhetoric, these two issues are often linked. The Greater Cincinnati Homeless Coalition works to coordinate services for the homeless, advocate for the protection of their rights, and educate the broader community about the issues facing the homeless. The coalition has just released a new study entitled Criminalization of Homeless Individuals in Cincinnati. This study examines the way that the law, the police, the courts, and the jails interact with the homeless. To discuss this study, I am joined now by Georgine Getty the Executive Director of the Greater Cincinnati Homeless Coalition, and Lynn Osman, a, the Civil Rights Coordinator for the Homeless Coalition and the primary author of this report. Welcome to Newsmakers. Georgine, welcome back. Oh, thanks for having us. Well, um, let's begin with, Georgine, what's, what's the scope? What, what did you try to set out to do in this study? Well, we'd long known that homeless people were being arrested for crimes that they were only being arrested for because they were homeless. Um, those crimes include like open container violation or public urination, things they can't help but do because they're doing their living outside. So we've known that that's been an issue for a while, but Lynn took, took it to the next level and actually researched how many people entered our jail system who listed a homeless address and started tracking the numbers on this and the rates of recidivism and just put a dollar amount to that. And Lynn, over what time period did you have data to work with here? I had records from October 1st, 2005 to September 30th, 2006. One year. One year. Okay. And in that year, what kind of crimes did uh, homeless people, people who are identified in the sense that when they were arrested, they either identified themselves as homeless, no home, or living at the drop-in shelter, whether they were or not. Uh, all those things, let's not get into that technicality. But how many people are we talking about here and what kind of crimes are we talking about? Well, a, a majority, about 44%, not quite a majority, uh, about 44% of the crimes that I found were what we have determined as homeless crimes. And those are the ones that Georgine just talked about. So sitting on the sidewalk, spitting, loitering, littering, open container. And if we look at, uh, a graph about homeless crimes that here that's from your report and it's hard to see on the screen and, and we'll give people a way to look at this uh, later on so that that big block there of on the left the 44% is yes. what you're talking about yeah and are any of these violent crimes or any of these serious crimes no most most of the crimes are all you know just normal everyday things that homeless people have to do to survive so if the shelter beds are full, they have to loiter, they have to trespass, it's, they can't get around it, they have to go somewhere. And, you know, a lot of homeless individuals suffer from mental illness and drug addiction, so alcohol is clearly something that they're going to have, and possession of an open flask, like I said, they have to, they have to go somewhere, and it's going to be somewhere. And when we say, in the law, open flask, what that means is any open bottle, alcohol bottle, right? You don't have to yes. just think about flask. Right. Yes. Um, you mentioned the mentally ill. Uh, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people miss the point sometimes that the mentally ill are using alcohol and drugs for sort of self-medication. So there, there's it isn't just drug use for fun or alcohol for fun, right? No, it's not. And 30% of homeless people are alcoholic or chemically addicted, and 30% have some sort of mental illness. And a lot of times those overlap. Like you said, people are self-medicating or they're caught in this cycle of addiction and they the mental illness keeps them from going in to get treatment. So uh, that's a lot of what we see, especially with people who live out on the streets and don't utilize the shelter systems. And that's those are the people who keep getting arrested. Okay, the, the vast majority of the documented arrests that you could find, the crimes that you could find, are these minor misdemeanors, misdemeanors generally. Yes. Um, but could there be an argument here? to play devil's advocate, could there be an argument that because you're on the streets and you're involved in all of that kind of activity, that what you end up, if you're involved with drugs, if you're involved with alcohol, that you end up 
being sucked into larger crimes? Is there an, a concern about stopping uh, criminal activity at the lowest possible level and therefore that could be an argument, Lynn? Possibly in some cases, but a lot of the cases that I found with individuals who had 30 plus arrests in the year period is that a lot of their crimes were across the board were these these 10 homeless crimes that we see all the time. So mm -hmm. trespassing, loitering, open container, you know, public indecency. You just mentioned 30 plus. You're saying some individuals are just getting arrested over and over and over again for the exact same thing? Correct, they're cycling through the systems. They're going from the streets to jail and then they're dropped off at the shelter and then once they get to the shelter, they stay maybe a couple nights, then they go back to the streets, right back to the same situation that put them in jail in the first place. What, what would have been the worst situation that you found in that sort of, in, in looking at those kinds of statistics? Is there sort of a, a peak? Um, the highest that we had, uh, he or she, she they uh, committed possibly, uh, it's about once a week that they were being arrested. Over a year period? Over a year period, a little bit over uh, 52. So. What's it cost? to incarcerate a person for that, you know, that often, to run them through the system that often? In Hamilton County, it's $65 per bed per night in the Hamilton County jails. So if we're talking about somebody like that person that you were just referencing that's being arrested almost every week, what kind of cost are we talking about over a year period? Uh, we averaged it out about 35000 a year per person. Per person that was being that arrested. particular person she was talking about cost the system I think it was five hundred and eighty thousand um, dollars. She also looked at fifty three homeless individuals who were arrested five times or more over the course of that year, and that's where the thirty five thousand number comes to. Um, if you take the number of arrests for just that those fifty three people who are continually arrested, it costs the system four point two million dollars. You know, we we got a graph up right now, uh, and what. This looks at the jail population. There's a lot of discussion about overcrowding in the jail and the need for a new jail. Mm -hmm. The darker peer, uh, seg segment at the top shows that's the homeless population there, the percentage right. th that's of the total population. Is that right? Correct. So what could that tell us about this larger discussion that's going on in the community right now mm -hmm. about the need for a new jail, overcrowding, the pressure on the present jail facilities? Where does that lead us? I think it leads us to looking for other alternatives besides jail. Um, like we mentioned, these are crimes people can't help but commit because they're homeless. Therefore, it makes sense that if you take them out of the homeless situation, um, if they're in their own home and they're still drinking, they're not getting arrested for it. They have uh, access to a bathroom. They have a place to be so that they're not getting loitering charges against them. And ultimately, if we're talking about $35,000 per person, that can buy you a really nice apartment, great support services, mental health treatment, alcohol addiction treatment. Now you were calculating in this study the cost of what this costs in terms of going through the, the legal court and jail systems, you know, $35,000. But that doesn't count how many times people like this end up being taken by the police often to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. Right, so there's another set of costs involved here uh, with emergency room costs, which can be very expensive. Absolutely, and then there's also the actual cost of you know jailing them and the court systems and the you know the medical systems. But then there's also the cost of that's time that police officers aren't apprehending violent criminals if they're taking in some guy. But doesn't doesn't the community have? And I'm talking about the community the rest of the community in over the Rhine or wherever this is taking place. Mm -hmm. People who you know, have families, whether they're middle class or poor or rich, it doesn't make any difference, who find the homeless hanging around on their street corners, drinking on the, on the street, urinating in public, don't they have a right not to get that away too? They do and that's what we're proposing. Homeless people don't want to be urinating in public, they don't want to be drinking in public or living outside. If we if we give them the housing that they need, the permanent supportive housing that they need, they're not out there in the public eye doing these things. They're happy, they're taken care of and the general quality of life in our city improves. Lynn, is there any city or cities in the United States that are 
uh, actively pursuing a, a significantly different policy than what we pursue here in Cincinnati? Of course. Uh, Columbus has permanent supportive housing. New York City, Chicago, Phoenix, uh, they're, they're spread across the United States and they come in many forms from scattered site housing that has supportive services to you know whole buildings of apartments for homeless individuals who for supportive housing. Columbus was the city that you mentioned and you mentioned it in your report as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, how, what, what percentage, and I know all these numbers are a little bit difficult, but what percentage of the homeless people did it really take off the streets? Because there's some people who simply don't want to be boxed in. They don't want to be part of any system. But in Columbus, do you have any sense of how many people took advantage of that supportive housing? I'm not sure of the exact numbers in Columbus, but we know that permanent supportive housing works for the 5 to 10 percent of homeless individuals who are constantly cycling through the system and that traditional methods of you know, traditional programs and traditional methods of getting people out of homelessness, they had just haven't been successful. So permanent supportive housing is really another alternative for them and it's, it's been successful for quite a few people. And I just want to add, um, there's about 1,300 homeless people each night in Cincinnati. 1,100 of them do utilize our social services. Um, the social services are there for them. They're homeless on average three to four months. Something's happened, they've hit a hard time, they use the shelter system and they get back on their feet. It's that other percentage of people who are living on the streets, the, who are chronically homeless, who have been homeless for a very long time, who can't or won't utilize the um, the shelter system for whatever reason. A lot of times it has to do with addiction and mental illness. Those are the people who are constantly getting arrested and those are the people who benefit most from permanent supportive housing. Um, it's literally taking them where they're at and putting them in a safe place of their own. And once people are stabilized in that kind of housing, they're much more likely to seek drug and alcohol treatment and mental health counseling. And that's what they've found in Columbus. Would one example of supportive housing in our city be Tender Mercies, which reaches mm -hmm. out to uh, the mentally ill uh, homeless? Yes, Tender Mercies is a great example. Um, takes mentally ill homeless people right off the street, puts them in their own apartment in a safe and nurturing environment, and really works with them. And that is a great example. Um, and we would like to see more things like that, especially for people with chemical addiction. And I'm just about out of time, but is your argument basically we're spending so much money already, it would just be a wiser way, a more efficient and long-term, more effective way to spend money? Yes. <clears throat> yes, we would love to see it as opposed to being housed in jail to being housed in their own apartment where they can be productive members of society and participate in all of the wonderful things that Cincinnati has to offer. I want to make sure that people have a chance to look at this study for themselves. Uh, one of the places uh, a lot of it's published, well, is one on the website, and you can get that at www.cincyhomeless.org, or if you're interested in the Homeless Coalition, 513-421-7803. Also, the latest issue of Street Vibes, uh, bought my issue last night uh, in downtown Cincinnati. It has a article which I think covered this first in the city, so you might want to pick that up. Stay, thank you very much. Stay thank tuned. You. At the same time, news stories focus on crime and poverty in Over the Rhine. Developers are busy converting old buildings into fancy new condos. After the break, a discussion about the future of Over the Rhine. Preservationists claim that Over the Rhine is the largest collection of 19th century buildings still extant in the United States. Developers are busy converting those buildings into lofts and condos for the middle class, a trend that makes advocates for the poor, who still live in the neighborhood, very nervous. Welcome back. 
The 1970s witnessed the rise of historic preservation, the revaluation of historic properties in the center city, and the rediscovery of urban living after a century of flight to the hilltops and the creation of suburbs. In Cincinnati, those force, forces focused attention on Over the Rhine, where the region's poorest people have been concentrated. The result is that Over the Rhine is the most politically, socially, economically contested piece of real estate in the region a place where conflicting visions of the future of society get projected and debated. I am joined this morning by Tom Dutton, Tom, and Tom is the, uh, an architect and a professor of architecture and interior design at the Miami University. Professor Dutton has been active in Over the Rhine People's Movement for two decades and is the director of the Miami University Center for Community Engagement in Over the Rhine. Tom, welcome to Newsmakers. Thank you. Um, Mike just mentioned the uh, Miami University Center. You bring students into Over the Rhine on a regular basis, and now you, some are living there for s semesters at a time. Is that correct? Yeah, we started the Over the Rhine residency program last fall, and we're going to do it again this fall. Twelve students lived and worked in the community and engaged in service lear uh, learning and community engagement projects. and. Uh, Severe, pretty interesting transformation of their learning by, by doing that. Good. Uh, that's the sort of hands-on, yep. immersive learning that really makes a difference in people's lives. Uh, this article that you wrote in the Cincinnati <coughs> Beacon, by the way, is entitled Indian Reservations, Trojan Horses, and Economic Mix. And people can still find it on Cincinnati Beacon and on the website. You introduce, you begin with this concept. Your basic concept is the in interest right now in economic mix and developing economic mix and over the run. What do you mean by that and why do you see this as problematic? Right. I've been fascinated with the term for quite a while. I mean, it's been, as I say in the piece, Cincinnati's mantra for a while and I decided to try and unpack what it means. It made me a little nervous actually that that term is used across all sections of Cincinnati, low-income advocates as well as corporate leaders all talk about economic mix as a positive thing. And one of the things that worries me is that we are living at a time where we are now geographically more racially segregated perhaps than we've ever been in our history as a country. So what does economic mix actually mean in that context? Is it actually possible? And one of the things I started to do was to do some research and it came across this person that wrote about the conflict within 1870s in our country between Native Americans and, and the American mainstream. And the thought was, can American Indians actually be assimilated into American culture? And the, that was the primary thought. The underside thought, the corollary dark side of that position was that the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Uh, they're heathen, savages, primitive. They're not able to be assimilated into American culture, and so the only thing that we could possibly do is to exterminate them, dispossess them of their lands, put them on reservations. I began to think about that relationship and what does it mean in the contemporary situation. So on one hand, we have economic mix. Over the Rhine can be everybody's neighborhood. We all can live there. Everybody should be able to live where they would like to live. But then the dark underside of that is a corollary belief of the gripping fear of the inner city. We have a deep and this is why crime and safety is the number one issue in Cincinnati. The gripping fear of the inner city, America fears blacks, America fears homeless. And in a sense, what do you do under that kind of condition? And I'm afraid that we're leading, heading towards extermination, dispossession of people's lands. The reservation has become the prison in today's society. You argue in here that those two competing views, mixed communities and this fear of the inner city, and particularly, you put it in racial terms, that these are irreconcilable is the term that you use here. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's no way to make this work? Well, it is the vision I hold on to. I mean, I might not use the term economic, economic mix. I like to use the term that I've learned from community leaders, which is equitable community development, that there needs to be equality or uh, you know, across racial lines and class lines. And I mean, the vision, my attachment to the people's movement from the get-go when I signed on in 1981, I was, I was motivated by the vision being articulated by people like Buddy Gray and Bonnie Neumeyer and other leaders that, that over the Rhine should be a place that is economically mixed, racially mixed. That, that was the vision, that is the vision still. But not on the terms that it's being pushed by the uh, political and 
economic well, my fear, development. The, 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 is, is that what you're saying? You're my, using my the term. Fear, my fear definition? is is that when I found this Indian metaphor, I mean this this Indian situation, my fear is that, you know, is there it perhaps breaks down into two kinds of camps. People say they want economic mix, but do they really believe it? Or there is a belief in economic mix, but the policies that are put in place actually undermine it. I mean, we could talk about 3CDC in that sense. That's right. I mean, um, 3CDC, I think, is trying to pursue a home ownership model. Mm -hmm. It's been pretty clear that it would like to basically increase home ownership in Cincinnati and over the Rhine. That's not necessarily a very bad thing at all. I mean, we need more homeowners. And lots of people have talked about that right. for right. 15, 15 years or more. The, the issue for me, however, is that I think that represents kind of a narrow effort or a narrow goal. Um, basically, over the, I mean, 3CDC's stated planning principles, there's actually very good stated planning principles that they would like to see housing development for all incomes. Mm -hmm. But if you pursue only home ownership, in that possible array that could be developed, then I fear that you're primarily pursuing a gentrifying model. I would love to hear 3CDC say um, something to this effect. Yes, more home ownership, but how about more rental for middle income people? How about more rental for lower moderate income people? How about more limited equity co-ops? How about more rent to own and renter equity projects? So you would want 3CDC, who has become uh, it's a private organization, but it is the development arm for the city at this point. Well, um, I mean, that's the way it's functioning. And you would like them to, to broaden out their vision of the type of housing that could be developed there. I'd like to have them not be in contradiction with their own planning principles. If they want to have a mix of, a mix of housing types and over the Rhine, you don't just pursue home ownership as the main strategy. It seems like an, an exclusive line, and it's in contradiction with their state of principles. You know, let's let's take a look and, and at, at a couple of things specifically. Um, let's take a look at an institution like Finley Market. It's right in the middle of over the Rhine. Lots of middle class people from all over the area come there to shop, especially on the weekends. Uh, cities invested lots of money. Uh, to improve Finley Market, and part of that is to encourage people of different backgrounds mm -hmm. to mix there. Is that a wise policy? Or do you support the city's vision of Finley Market in the middle of Over the Rhine? Is that a good thing to be happening? Yes, I mean, I think Finley Market is a wonderful space where all kinds of people of all kinds of classes and races can come together. I mean, in that sense, it's one of the more truer public spaces that we have in over the Rhine and Cincinnati, urban America. I mean, those kinds of spaces are becoming more or less few and far between, actually. So it's not, it, we're, we're in a situation now where there's been such a depopulation of over the Rhine. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of talk about concentrated poverty, but in a sense, there's been massive depopulation. So really, it's more like the New Orleans strategy that we need to be thinking about regarding Over the Rhine. You know, can there be a right of return on the part of people to come back to Over the Rhine, not just a home ownership level, a market rate level, but people that you know, make, according to the plan, the Over the Rhine Comprehensive Plan of 2002, which called for a multiplicity of incomes to be represented in Over the Rhine. So that's where are the programs to help support all that array. Okay, I just, and I, there's one other point I just want to get make sure I'm clear about, um, you know, as an architect, I'm sure you uh, <coughs> love, appreciate the architecture in over no, the yeah, Rhine. Absolutely. And, uh, but anybody who knows the area knows that time and lack of maintenance uh, takes a big toll on, mm -hmm. on these older buildings to the point that a lot of them reach the point where water has seeped in, they start to crumble, and what we end up with, and what we're going to be seeing on the screen here very quickly, is literally just empty lots right. uh, in the streetscape. Right. Somebody's <coughs> got to invest. Right. And so that investment money's got to come from development folks because there isn't enough public money to do it, let's face it. It's got to come out of the private sector. Uh, and so you're not opposed to investment, you're just opposed, you just want to broaden the base. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Well, I mean... Because the, the, this comes across a little bit right. more open than the article comes across, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Well, we could talk about that. That'd be nice to know how, how, I, how you think it's different. Because I don't think I'm being different in a sense, because I've been calling for an array of development types for a long time. The, 
I mean, there does need to be more investment, absolutely. I think I differ with you a little in the sense that I would hope that the government needs to step up. I am not a big believer that the market can save over the Rhine. The market has been very good historically at creating more or less homogeneous geographic sections. This is why we have that's what, what we have in the That's what in neighborhoods and suburbs are. That's right. And so, I mean, when a lot of people talk about concentrated poverty and over the Rhine, they fail to talk about the other side of the coin, which is sort of a whiteness produced in the suburbs, right? A middle class whiteness. I was always struck after the up, uprising in 2001 about when people would write letters into the community, into the Cincinnati Enquirer. Yeah. They would say something to the effect, God, I'm so glad living out here in the suburbs, I'm not dealing with any racial issues. Right, uh, yeah, as not seeing the big picture. That's right. I am out of time. Stimulating article. People can go to Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Beacon on the web, see it. Enjoyed having you have you back. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Next week, a discussion of the new Creation Museum opening in Boone County. Have a good week.